My name is Rachel Dutton, and I am a Bauer Fellow at the Harvard University Center for Systems Biology. And I'm going to be talking today about the work of my lab using cheese as a model system for studying microbial communities. So I'd like to start with the question of why should we even study microbial communities? So the fact is, is that most microbes in nature exist as part of communities. However, we know incredibly little about what is actually happening within these communities of microbes. So often, as a microbiologist, what we'll study is an organism in isolation in the lab. So for example, E. coli growing as a population of cells um, uh, individually. However, in the real world, what we have are these communities of different species living together. And so that's not to say that one of these is necessarily a better way to study microbes, just that we can get at different types of questions about biology under these two different types of uh, um, systems. So in the lab, by studying E. coli over many decades, we have a really fundamental understanding of how cells work, how they respond to the environment, how they use nutrients, how they grow. However, if we are able to study microbes within the context of a community, we might be able to get at some questions that um, will contain very interesting biology, such as how often uh, do species interact with each other, what are the mechanisms they use to do so, and are there any general principles um, or mechanisms of community formation. So these microbial communities are pretty much everywhere on the planet. So whether we're thinking about the soil, um, in which you have billions of organisms in every gram, or the human body. So for example, in the gut, we have, uh, again, um, billions of organisms in, in every single one of us. Now the challenge with understanding how these communities work is that these communities are often incredibly complex. So in these two systems, for example, we have hundreds or thousands of different species all living together. So if we want to be able to understand how these communities work, we might be able to take an approach similar to using E. coli as a model organism where we use model communities or model ecosystems. So can we actually come up with model ecosystems that will help us understand how these complex multi-species communities work? What we'd ide ideally like to have is an experimentally tractable ecosystem that we can use to really link the ecology of the system, what's happening out in it, the natural environment, to mechanism of how things work. So what we'd like to be able to do is have a microbial ecosystem where we can study the microbial ecology in the native setting. And this will allow us to generate hypotheses about how this community functions and what it does. Then what we'd like to be able to do is bring the system into the lab and be able to deconstruct it um, through isolation of the organisms that are present in this community, and then ideally reconstruct it under conditions that resemble those found in the environment so that we can start to test hypotheses um, of how these microbes form communities and eventually get to a mechanistic understanding of how uh, the system works. So what kind of communities might we uh, look towards for finding these sort of um, experimentally tractable systems? Um, we'd like an ecosystem that is relatively simple, so instead of hundreds or thousands of species, maybe on the order of tens of species that we would uh, work with. We would like for this community to be very reproducible. It would be great if it was easy to get a hold of samples, easy to access the community itself, and ideally something where we can manipulate the community at many different levels, whether we're thinking of the environment in which the community is growing, um, the substrates on which it's growing, or the individual organisms. Now, in my lab, we're using fermented foods as our model ecosystems. And fermented foods are actually one of the most ancient forms of biotechnology, where humans have intentionally manipulated environments so that we can control the growth of certain types of microbes. And many of these fermented foods actually have these wonderful reproducible microbial communities forming during the process of fermentation. So we'll spend the rest of the time today talking about cheese, but there's many other examples. Um, we have uh, fermented beers, dry salamis and sausages, uh, fermented uh, vegetables such as uh, kimchi, which is fermented cabbage, 
Uh, chocolate and coffee are both great examples of fermented foods, uh, things like pickles, um, natto, uh, which is a really interesting Japanese fermentation, and things like soy sauce. So pretty much every culture on the planet has come up with uh, many different examples of fermented foods, and all of these fermentations involve the metabolism of different foods by microbial communities. And in the case of cheese, there are two really important steps in cheese making uh, in which microbial communities are um, important. So we have uh, microbes actually responsible for the complete transformation of milk into cheese through a couple different steps. So we start with milk, which um, will come from some dairy animal, uh, whether it's a cow or goat or sheep. And this milk, from the perspective of a microbe, really is just a great source of food. So we drink milk because it's nutritious. Uh, microbes also think it's very nutritious. So milk is a great source of protein in the form of casein, uh, lactose in the form, uh, sugar in the form of lactose, and fat in the form of different kinds of triglycerides. Um, the way that this uh, simple, uh, very common uh, food source is transformed into cheese is first through the action of lactic acid bacteria and the enzyme rennet. So lactic acid bacteria are, um, can be commonly found in many different environments and they're also uh, found in milk um, or they can be added to the milk to, um, to make cheese. And these lactic acid bacteria, um, they're also known as starter cultures, are really what help turn the milk into the curds, which is the first stage of cheese making. And they do this through the fermentation of the milk sugar lactose. So if we have uh, lactose, these bacteria have an enzyme which is able to break down lactose, which is a disaccharide, into the simple sugars, and then take these simple sugars and ferment them for energy. And this results in the production of lactic acid. Lactic acid um, serves many different purposes in cheese making as well as in many different fermented foods. Um, some of these purposes are the flavor, so it gives the sort of tartness uh, to the food. Um, it helps in preservation, so the acidity inhibits the growth of many pathogens that might otherwise be a problem in uh, food spoilage. And it helps the protein or the casein in the milk start to come together into aggregates, which are called curds. Now, if you were to just uh, use lactic acid bacteria, um, during the production or for the fermentation of milk, what you would end up with is yogurt. So yogurt is a very simple um, fermented product which just uses the action of these lactic acid bacteria to coagulate the milk into this gel or, of yogurt. Um, with cheese making, the enzyme rennet helps stimulate the further coagulation of the, the milk proteins into curd so that you can separate the whey from the curd. And that curd is what becomes the starting point for many different kinds of cheese. So the second stage, which I think is the most interesting part of cheese making, is the, the secondary stage, which is the aging of the cheese. So initially you have the lactic acid bacteria growing, you have the fresh cheese formed, which basically just tastes a little bit like sour milk, something very fresh and tart. You can take this cheese now and age it, um, and depending on how you age it, you get many different kinds of uh, aged cheeses, which have different aromas, flavors, textures, appearances. And the key um, factor in determining what type of aged cheese you end up with are the microbes that are colonizing the surface of the cheese. So we have different bacteria and fungi, many of which are coming in from the environment, they're not inoculated, um, yet they form these reproducible communities on the surface of the cheese. So this rind uh, forms during the aging process, and this rind is actually a surface-associated microbial community. So um, if you look at this picture here, this is a, a close-up of a cross-section of a slice of cheese, um, and this top layer is the rind, or this um, uh, biofilm that's formed during the aging process. And the first time I saw a cheese up close like this, it reminded me of when I was a student in the microbial diversity course at Woods Hole at the MBL. And we had spent a lot of time out in the salt marshes looking at microbial mats. And 
it reminded me of exactly of a microbial mat. So you have this um, beautiful uh, community that's forming um, on a surface. And so I say this to make the point that the communities that we're studying on the rind of cheese are not really unique to cheese. They are an example of a type of community that you find um, in many different environments. In the case of microbial mats, we have fossil evidence suggesting that this type of microbial community can date back at least 3.2 billion years. So um, these rind communities can take many different forms. So we have here a picture of many different kinds of aged cheeses. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, of varieties of cheese. And uh, we wanted to um, get an idea of what type of diversity there is within these communities. So when um, I started this project, we would just do simple things like uh, culture from the surface of the cheese just to get an idea of what types of microbes we might find in this environment. And these are just some pictures that I took from uh, cultures that we grew in the lab just on standard media on petri dishes. And these are just close-up shots of some of the gorgeous organisms that we have growing together in these communities. So in this particular one, we have filamentous fungi or molds um, growing with what appeared to be bacterial cells, bacterial colonies. Here's another where we have a mixture of different types of microbes growing together. Um, these are all isolated from different types of cheeses. And, uh, another here where we have another mold growing um, with other bacteria. And again, um, just uh, really wonderful microbial communities that we have isolated from these cheeses. Now, this is looking at colonies that we've isolated from the surface of a cheese, but what happens if we look directly at these communities? What does that look like? So we've done some scanning electron microscopy to visualize the communities directly in C2, and uh, this is looking top down uh, at the surface of a, of a cheese. So this is the rind of the cheese, and conveniently, a little chunk has sort of uh, been removed from the top of this cheese. So we can start to see the inside of this, this community. And if we go down deeper into the rind, if you sort of imagine that you shrink yourself down to the size of a bacterium, and you're standing inside the rind of a cheese, and you look around, this is what you would see. So we see this incredible collection of different microbial cells. So we have these small cells of different shapes, which look like they are bacterial cells, um, different types of bacteria. We have fungal cells, so these look uh, like they could be spores from fungi. And this is an incredibly densely packed environment. So um, we estimate that we have about 10 billion cells for every gram of cheese rind that you would eat. So what we'd like to do is use this wonderful uh, fermented food to try and dissect the formation of microbial communities. So we could, could we actually use cheese as a model ecosystem, um, something where we can study the diversity and ecology of the system in its natural state. We could potentially dissect it into the lab and then recreate conditions so that we can start forming the communities and understanding how they work. And so the first step we had to do is actually characterize what types of microbes are present. So despite the fact that cheese has been made for thousands of years, we don't really have a very complete understanding of what types of microbes are present on cheese, as well as many of these other fermented foods. So we took a approach to look at the organisms using DNA sequencing technologies. Um, and I thought I'd go through very quickly how we actually approach this question. Um, when we have an environmental sample, how do we actually know which species are present in this environment when we can't necessarily distinguish all the organisms by eye? So the first thing we do is go out to the environment and collect samples. So in our case, we're collecting samples from cheese. We collect the surface of the cheese or the rind, um, and then we bring it back to the lab. Once we get the sample back to the lab, we um, remove the DNA from the rest of the sample, and that's what we're going after is the DNA. So the genetic information from each of these cells, so every single microbial cell has its genome, 
we extract those genomes from the sample. Now with this mixture of genomes, what we can do is use a method called PCR to just target regions that are somewhat like a fingerprint for a microbe. So every different microbe has a different sequence uh, based on what species it is. And by looking at this region, we can identify what type of species are present. So once we've amplified these samples using PCR, what we can do is um, sequence each of these regions from the different species. So we can uh, use this next generation sequencing to uh, actually read out all of the sequences that are present in any sample that we have. And then to be able to determine what species are actually present, we then compare the sequences or these fingerprints to databases. So we can um, use several different types of databases which have collections of microbial sequences that we use as references. So this gives us a good idea of the, the amount of diversity and the particular organisms that we have in each of our samples. So using this method, we wanted to look as broadly as possible um, to see what type of diversity is present in cheeses around the world. So to sample the microbial diversity of cheese, what we did was collect samples from 10 different countries, 137 different types of cheese, and 362 wheels of cheese. And uh, we took each of these samples through the protocol that I just told you about um, to look at the types of bacteria and fungi that are present in each of these communities. And so this is a representation of the, the data that we have from this study. Uh, we have on the top a uh, set of columns um, the different abundances of bacteria in each of the samples, and the bottom set of columns the different abundances of fungi. Um, and e in this uh, graph, each of the columns is a different type of cheese. And so we took this data, we clustered them based on the similarity of species within each of the communities, and you can start to see some of these uh, similar clusters of cheeses that have related communities on this uh, phylogenetic tree. Now, when we started looking at what organisms were actually present in these cheeses, we had a few surprises. And so if we start to now zoom in on the bacteria that we found in these samples, um, what we see are 14 dominant genera of bacteria. So these are all of the genera that we find at greater than 1% abundance across our data set. And while some of these organisms have been studied in various fermented foods before, such as Staphylococcus and Brevibacterium, um, we had a couple organisms that were new to fermented foods, had never been described in cheese or any other fermented food before, such as Nocardiopsis and Yaniella. We don't really know uh, what they're contributing to the cheese environment. Um, but they can be very abundant in certain samples. And the other surprising thing about the bacterial sample is that we, we actually have a lot of bacteria that you would normally associate with a marine environment. So we have many um, sequences that belong to the genera Halomonas, um, Psychobacter, Pseudoalteromonas, and Vibrio, um, which are very often associated with marine environments. And so we're very interested in understanding where these microbes are coming from and what they might be doing in this particular community. So if we look at the fungal uh, portion of the diversity, um, we see a slightly smaller um, set of organisms, so 10 dominant genera that we find over and over again in different cheeses. Um, again, some of these have been studied before, uh, Diberomyces and Galactomyces, for example, um, but then we have this wonderful collection of other fungi, which we know very little about. So for example, Scopulariopsis, which you can see in brown, um, is very abundant in um, many of the samples, and we know virtually nothing about this organism. Um, yet we think it has some really interesting roles in terms of interactions, which I'll show you in a moment. So this is looking at the cheese at its sort of final stage, right? before it'd be ready to eat. So these are the communities after they've already been established. But one of the nice things about working with fermented foods is that you can sample the formation of the community as it's actually happening. 
Uh, this is something that can be really challenging in many environments um, where it's not clear where the beginning and end of community formation is. So these communities we know are very dynamic. This is a picture from uh, aging a cheese in a cave in Vermont. And over a two-month aging period, you can see this very uh, dramatic change of the microbial community over time, just by eye. And so we wanted to go in and use these sequencing methods to actually tell us what was happening within the formation of these communities. How did the communities get to the point that we saw in the previous study? And so we ended up sampling three different batches of cheese. Uh, we sampled the cheeses every week as they were aging. And what you can see is this absolutely beautiful and reproducible succession of species. So this is very um, uh, consistent change over time of species within these communities. So at early time points, you see that the community is dominated in the bacterial portion of the community by the bacterium Staphylococcus, the green bacterium in this graph. Um, and then over time, the community shifts to one in which is dominated by the bacterium Brevibacterium. Um, in the fungal portion of the community, we also see a succession where the community early on is dominated by the yeast candida in light green. And then that's followed by the filamentous fungi or molds, uh, penicillium, and then eventually Scopulariopsis. And so from this type of data, we think that um, this is a nice way of generating hypotheses about which organisms might be important in the establishment uh, of a community and in directing what types of organisms eventually end up in the specific community. So this generates a lot of questions for us about, for example, whether staphylococcus growth is required for the later growth of the species such as Brevibacterium or for the fungi as well. And this is something we're actively following up in, with in the lab. So what we've done so far is try to get a picture of the microbial ecology of the system. So we've taken these um, molecular microbial ecology and sequencing-based approaches to get a good picture of the diversity of the microbes in these communities. So now we have an idea of what these communities look like. Can we actually bring them into the lab and start to dissect them? So are we able to uh, pull apart the communities into their individual species components? And so um, what I'm showing you here are, from our sequencing, the most abundant uh, bacteria that we find in the system. So the average relative abundance of the different bacteria that we see across all the cheeses. And so we went in and, and actively um, went after each of these organisms and tried to culture them in the lab. And it turns out that we're able to culture rep representatives of every single one of these bacterial groups. So we have now this wonderful culture collection of different bacteria. So we have uh, different actinobacteria, different proteobacteria, different bacteroides, and different firmicutes. For the fungi, we did the same thing. Um, and again, we're able to culture representatives of every single one of the major genera that we found in our cheese. So um, we have now a mixture of phylogenetically diverse molds and yeasts that um, make up the uh, fungal portion of these communities. So what we've been able to do to this point now is have an understanding of the ecology and we've been able to establish a cultural collection with all of the dominant organisms. And this can be a really challenging part of studying microbial communities because it's often very difficult to be able to culture these organisms in isolation from the rest of the community. So what do we do with this culture collection? So we wanted to know, can we actually start to reconstruct communities in the lab um, so that we can start to ask questions about what the role of these different microbes are um, in community formation? So what we've tried to do now is rebuild cheese. And we do this by um, doing what we refer to as in vitro cheese making. So in uh, um, traditional cheese making, a cheese maker will make a cheese, place it into a cave-like environment. Um, this cheese can be turned or washed or uh, uh, treated in different ways to end up with a certain type of cheese. And uh, so you end up with this diversity of cheeses depending on how you treat the cheese. 
Now we can do this in the lab. So we make um, cheese curd based media. We pour this into plates and we can actually manipulate the species that are going into our cheese and the way we treat the cheese in the laboratory. So we go from our collection of species, we reconstruct communities and follow their behavior over time. So we wanted to try and reconstruct community formation. So what we did was a very simple experiment where we took the dominant microbes that we found in the natural succession and we mix them together in equal numbers, um, so all the bacteria and fungi, at, equal, at the same time. So we basically took them together in equal numbers, put them onto our in vitro media, and asked what happens uh, when you mix these organisms together. And what we saw was remarkably that succession in vitro follows a very similar course to what we see in C2. So this is showing the uh, changes in the population sizes of the different species over time. Um, again, we started with uh, approximately equal numbers of the different bacteria and fungi, mix them together, and what you see is that you get similar pattern of succession. So the bacteria, initially Staphylococcus, dominates the community that's followed by Brevibacterium. And in the fungi, initially the yeast candida dominates the community, and that's then followed by the filamentous fungi Penicillium and Scopulariopsis. So what this tells us is that the succession that we're seeing in these communities is um, not in any way random. It's not dependent on the order of arrival of the different organisms. There's something intrinsic about the growth of these organisms in this particular environment that leads to this um, particular type of community formation. And so what we're doing in the lab now is trying to now remove species and look at uh, if we remove, say, Staphylococcus, what happens to the rest of the community? And that's something we can do by having this very experimentally tractable system. Now, one of the other things that we're starting to uh, look at in a lot more detail are interactions between species. We know from um, uh, working with the system that we have observed many different interactions between microbes isolated from cheese. So we have examples of pretty much every type of interaction, positive and negative. Um, we have examples of interactions between bacteria, between fungi, and uh, between bacteria and fungi. And so these are just some pictures of some of the very uh, dramatic looking interactions where we have um, stimulation of bacteria by fungi, for example, or these very uh, dramatic zones of inhibition that we see um, upon growing fungi in the presence of certain bacteria. So we wanted to develop a way to look at this in a, a more systematic way. And so what we've done is uh, use 96 well plate cheese curd auger to look at a series of pairwise interactions. And what we've done so far is look at um, interactions between bacteria and fungi, which we know um, are both important players in the system. And so we can take from our collection of cultured organisms and grow them in any combination we want and look at how they grow either by themselves or in combination with another organism. And so I'll show you some data from uh, some of these types of interactions, um, which has revealed to us that interactions between species in the system are incredibly widespread. And so what you're seeing here on the top panel are, is the growth of the different bacteria that uh, some of which, uh, some of the bacteria that we find in the system um, and how they, their growth responds in the presence of different fungi. So in black, in the black bars, we have the growth of the bacterium alone, and in the colored bars are their growth in the presence of different fungi. So what you can see is that the bacteria are hugely influenced by the presence of fungi. So they can be either influenced in a positive way, so their growth is stimulated, or in a negative way, so their growth is inhibited. In contrast, the fungi, which you see on the bottom panel, don't really seem to be impacted by the presence of bacteria, with a few exceptions. So um, one very noticeable exception is the growth of Scopulariopsis, um, which is inhibited very strongly by the presence of one of the bacteria, Arthrobacter. And so this is um, one of the ways that we're starting to generate information about 
the types of interactions that we have in our system, and then eventually what we'd like to know um, is what is the genetic basis of these interactions and what's the chemical basis of these interactions. So what I've told you so far is that we've been able to go in, look at the microbial ecology, dissect the system, and now have a in vitro system for reconstructing the community in which we see communities that form that resemble the natural system and that we can now start to dissect and understand the interactions that are at the base of this community formation. So beyond understanding these particular microbial communities, we think that this work will have broad impacts in the field of microbiology. Uh, for example, we think that having this very experimentally tractable microbial ecosystem, we can start to get at some of the general principles of microbial community formation. And we think that in doing so, we'll have an impact on advancing the conceptual, practical, and mechanistic understanding of communities, either in these simple systems or hopefully more complex systems. And we think that these more complex systems, which are often very difficult to manipulate, we might be able to gain some insight specifically into the types of interactions or uh, mechanisms that are important for community formation. One of the um, potentially interesting connections would be to human skin. We see actually a lot of phylogenetic overlap between the species found on our skin and the species on cheese. We also think that because there are widespread interactions, especially between bacteria and fungi in the system, we might be able to do things like discover uh, molecules to manipulate the growth of individual species or uh, manipulate the formation of communities, which could be important for human health um, or the environment or even more applied systems. So I'd like to thank a number of people for um, helping with the, the data that I've presented in this uh, seminar. Um, I have a great lab at, at Harvard, uh, two wonderful postdocs, Benjamin Wolf and Julie Button, who've been involved in every aspect of this work. Um, I want to thank the Bauer Fellows Program and the FAS Center for Systems Biology at Harvard for supporting my lab, um, and funding from the NIGMS Center for Systems Biology. I'd like to thank Marcella Santorelli, who was a visiting graduate student who helped with some of this work, as well as Jasper Hill Farm and Sellers for collaboration and uh, providing us with many samples and access to different cheeses. Thank you. <laughs>